Thank you for that introduction. Today, I will focus on enhanced drug distribution security requirements under the Drug Supply Chain Security Act that helps to identify and prevent the introduction of counterfeit, stolen, and other potentially harmful drugs from entering the supply chain. I will review a recent example of a counterfeit drug and provide implementation updates. My learning objectives for this session are to provide an overview of the key supply chain security requirements under the Drug Supply Chain Security Act, or DSCSA, for the distribution of prescription drugs, and to describe implementation updates for trading partners in the pharmaceutical supply chain. And by trading partners, I am referring to manufacturers, repackagers, wholesale distributors, and dispensers. Please note that I will be referring to the law, the Drug Supply Chain Security Act, as DSCSA for the remainder of this presentation. The pharmaceutical supply chain, also referred to as the drug supply chain, includes many entities that are involved in the manufacture, distribution, and dispensing of prescription drugs, ultimately for administration to patients. To maintain the integrity of the supply chain, it is important to know who touches the product and what the vulnerabilities or threats are to the supply chain. If we can protect the product, we can protect patients from receiving a potentially harmful product like a counterfeit drug. This slide shows the potential threats to the pharmaceutical supply chain. There could be bad products or bad players or both. Illegitimate product includes drugs that are counterfeit, diverted, stolen, intentionally adulterated, subject to a fraudulent transaction or otherwise unfit for distribution, such that it would result in serious adverse health consequences or death to humans. I know that's a mouthful, but I'm sure no one wants to receive a counterfeit or stolen product. There may be unscrupulous players in the supply chain that may sell and distribute illegitimate product or that don't store drugs properly to maintain the strength and quality. Think if drugs that need to be kept cold under refrigeration. If these were stolen and stored in a hot truck for several days, we wouldn't want these products to make it back into the supply chain. These types of threats can occur anywhere along the pharmaceutical supply chain. We are currently working with the manufacturer Janssen to investigate counterfeit versions of Simtuza, an HIV drug found in the United States. Recent counterfeit versions of Simtuza were found in three pharmacies in the U.S. These pharmacies bought the counterfeit versions from entities that were not authorized distributors. Often, manufacturers have business or contractual agreements with certain wholesale distributors to sell and distribute their product, as is the case for Simtuza. This helps to secure the supply chain for their product by knowing who is involved, ensuring that they are appropriately licensed, and following requirements for storage and handling of prescription drugs to maintain product quality. This counterfeit is another example of why patients are in danger of getting an ineffective medicine or one that may contain harmful ingredients. This is also why DSCSA requirements are important to improve the security of the supply chain to help ensure that those involved in the manufacture, distribution, dispensing, and administration of prescription drugs are authorized to do so. DSCSA requirements provide transparency and accountability of the pharmaceutical supply chain. Protecting the supply chain ultimately protects patients, and DSCSA helps us to do this. A few years ago, we found counterfeit versions of a cancer drug in the United States. It took several years to find and hold those bad players accountable. DSCSA provides FDA with additional tools, to identify and investigate bad drug product in the supply chain and help to prevent their distribution so they don't reach patients. DSCSA enables FDA and trading partners to respond better and quicker to protect patients from receiving illegitimate product. The goals of DSCSA are to implement interoperable electronic tracing products at the package level by 2023 this includes secure tracing of product at the package level, use of product identifiers to verify product at the package level, enabling prompt response to suspect and illegitimate product when they are found, and improving the efficiency of recalls. 
I'll explain these in a little more detail in the next few slides, including some of these terms and what they mean. Also under DSCSA, FDA is establishing national standards for licensure for wholesale distributors and third-party logistics providers, or 3PLs. These standards for licensure will improve the oversight over those entities that are involved in the storage and distribution of prescription drugs. The authorities under DSCSA began in 2013, and many requirements that are highlighted here have been phased in over the years, like product tracing and verification at the lot level in 2015, and serialization of products in 2018. With the goal of getting to enhanced requirements that go into effect in 2023. The result will be an electronic interoperable system for product tracing down to the package level by 2023. Let's talk about who and what prescription drugs are affected by these requirements. Trading partners under DSCSA include drug manufacturers, repackagers, wholesale distributors, dispensers, and third-party logistics providers, or 3PLs. This slide summarizes two very important definitions for product and transaction that determine which prescription drugs are covered under the law. For products, you can see prescription drugs in finished dosage form for human use are affected by these requirements. There are some exceptions highlighted here, such as blood or components intended for transfusions or radioactive drugs. In addition, the term transaction has many exclusions, such that if a drug is involved in these types of distributions, they are not covered under this law and the requirements do not apply. Please refer to the actual definitions for product and transaction in Section 581 of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act for the specific exemption or exclusion, as this slide only provides abbreviated bulleted information. The four key requirements under DSC say are authorized trading partner, product tracing, verification, and product identification, which includes serialization. These requirements apply to manufacturers, repackagers, wholesale distributors, and dispensers, which means primarily pharmacies here. The first requirement that I will discuss is the authorized trading partner requirement. This means that any trading partner in the supply chain involved in the manufacture, distribution, or dispensing of prescription drugs must have proper registration or licensing as applicable. So for manufacturers and repackagers, you have to have valid registration with FDA. And we have a drug establishment registration database known as DECRES or DECRS, where you can find this information. In the case of wholesale distributors or WDDs and 3PLs, you can check individual state databases for current licensure, or FDA now has a searchable database that includes self-reported information from each wholesale distributor and 3PL and their respective state licensure. And this is all in one place. And then for pharmacies, you have to check individual state databases to confirm active licensure. This ensures that trading partners are following additional requirements to meet registration or licensing requirements. For example, proper storage and warehousing by a wholesale distributor to maintain strength, potency, and identity of a prescription drug. Recall my earlier example of drugs that may need to be maintained under refrigeration. FDA has issued a guidance for industry that clarifies other entities or terms to help identify who is considered a trading partner under DSCSA and therefore who must comply with these requirements. Based on the activities performed, the guidance provides specific clarifications on who is considered or may not be considered a manufacturer, a repackager, wholesale distributor, 3PL, or dispenser. I will provide a resource page at the end of this session that has all the guidances that I will have reviewed in this presentation. Let's take a few minutes to do our first challenge question. Key supply chain security requirements under DSCSA include which of the following? A, product tracing, B, verification, C, authorized trading partner, D, product identification, or E, all of the above?
If you answered E, all of the above, you are correct. Remember that key DSCSA requirements will apply to all trading partners in the supply chain and includes product tracing, verification, authorized trading partner, and product identification. Let's continue and go into a little more detail for the remaining requirements. The main provisions of the product tracing requirement are shown here. Product tracing involves receiving and providing transactional documentation for each sale of product. This includes transaction information, or TI, transaction history, or TH, and transaction statement, or TS. These three terms are defined in the law and can be found in Section 581 of the Food Drug Cosmetic Act. These records related to each transaction need to be maintained for at least six years. This applies to both the seller and the buyer. And returned product can only be returned to who you brought the drug from. I want to point out that currently product tracing is done at the lot level, meaning only lot level information is required. And the TI, TH, and TS can be either in paper or electronic formats. However, in November 2023, the Enhanced Drug Distribution Security Requirements go into effect, and product tracing will include package level information, meaning serial numbers for each package, and all information is to be electronic. To help trading partners and other stakeholders, FDA issued a couple of guidances related to standards for product tracing. These guidances are summarized on this slide, and you can read this information on your own. Of course, you should review these guidances for the full context that will describe the agency's current recommendations for enabling interoperable data exchange for product tracing requirements. And we are also working on updating many of these guidances. What about those illegitimate products that I spoke about earlier? I will review the verification requirements for how to properly handle suspect and illegitimate product to find and remove them from the supply chain. Here is how suspect and illegitimate product are defined. While the definitions look very similar, the key difference is that there is credible evidence that a product is illegitimate. This is essential for trading partners to make that determination, and this triggers specific notification to FDA about the illegitimate product. You can see that we are trying to protect patients from illegitimate product that may be harmful. These products include products that are counterfeit, diverted, stolen, or subject of a fraudulent transaction, or intentionally adulterated, or otherwise appear unfit for distribution, such that the product would result in serious adverse health consequences or death. Here are examples of what you may consider as a suspect product. For example, if you see something different or missing on the label, like a missing NDC or lot number, or you may see a damaged or broken seal. FDA issued a guidance for industry explaining how to identify a suspect product that I will mention later in another slide. If you identify a suspect product, there are steps to take to investigate to determine if it is illegitimate or not. Steps to deal with suspect or illegitimate product all fall under the verification requirements in DSCSA. Verification requirements include quarantine and investigation of suspect product to determine if it's illegitimate. If a suspect product is determined to be illegitimate, remember that credible evidence, then the trading partner must notify FDA and other immediate trading partners within 24 hours of that determination. The other immediate trading partners are those that may have bought or received the illegitimate product. When an illegitimate product is found, there is an expectation that trading partners will work together to find and remove those products from the supply chain and ensure that the products are not further distributed to protect patients from receiving them. And the records related to verification requirements, including investigations, also need to be maintained for at least six years. Here are the guidances for industry that FDA has issued related to verification requirements. These guidances supplement each other and should be considered together as they provide recommendations for how to identify suspect product and describe the process for notifying FDA of illegitimate product, which are listed here in the first guidance. 
In the second guidance listed, FDA clarifies definitions and terms to better identify suspect or illegitimate product. And in the third guidance, we describe recommendations for a robust verification system as a whole for suspect and illegitimate product, including all these steps, determination, quarantine, investigation, and disposition, including dealing with saleable return product. Let's focus again on what to do if illegitimate product is found. If a trading partner determines that it has illegitimate product in its possession or control, in addition to quarantining the product, the trading partner needs to notify FDA within 24 hours of making that determination. To do this, FDA developed a form FDA 3911 for drug notifications to collect information about the product and other relevant information about the situation or incident. FDA reviews these notifications to determine if we need to respond to protect public health. We will work with trading partners to do our best to protect patients and the supply chain in general. The 3911 should also be used when the trading partner wants to terminate the notification. A snapshot of the first page of two pages is shown here. Separately, trading partners should also notify other immediate trading partners within 24 hours that may have received the product. You can find detailed information and instructions for submitting drug notifications of illegitimate product to FDA on our website at the link provided on this slide. Let's now talk about the product identifier requirement, which involves serialization. By serialization, we mean assigning a unique serial number to each package of product or homogenous case of product. This is accomplished through the product identifier requirement. Since 2018, manufacturers and repackagers have been encoding their products covered by DSCSA with a product identifier on the smallest individual saleable unit. Now that products have the serialized information on the package, verification requirements include verifying to the package level if requested. The product identifier is composed of four key data elements, the National Drug Code, or NDC, the serial number, which can be alphanumeric and up to 20 characters, lot number, and expiration date. These data elements must be in two formats, a human-readable format and a machine-readable format. Examples of these formats are shown on the slide. The machine-readable format that is currently required is a two-dimensional, or 2D for short, data matrix barcode for packages and either a linear barcode or 2D data matrix barcode for homogenous cases. These barcodes will enable electronic data capture through scanning and reading of the data that is encoded into the barcode. And for product tracing and verification, which is our current focus, you can see how use of this technology will enable the fully electronic interoperable enhanced system envisioned by 2023. Of course, Barcodes are currently used for other purposes, and the product identifier will likely affect these other uses, such as ordering, inventory management, medical records, and insurance or payer billing. Now, having product identifiers on product packages with serial numbers is very exciting for the healthcare system. But remember earlier, I mentioned that some drugs are excluded from these requirements. Also, there may be products that are considered grandfathered, because they are already in distribution in the supply chain. In addition, FDA may grant a waiver, exception, or exemption of certain requirements for specific products or transactions. This means we will have a mixture of prescription drug packages in the supply chain that will not have product identifiers, and some that will, and this is allowed under the law. Now, if you're unsure of whether a product should have a product identifier, we recommend checking with the original manufacturer or repackager of product. FDA also issued a guidance about product identifiers in a question and answer format. This guidance includes contact information for barcode related questions, recommendations for standardizing the information that is contained in the product identifier for both human and machine readable formats, recommendations for submitting labeling changes under DSCSA, clarification of FDA's interpretation of DSCSA product identifier requirements, 
as they relate to linear barcode requirements under Title 21 CFR 201.25 in the Code of Federal Regulations. And the guidance also includes examples of when product identifiers or the linear barcode are required for different types of product packaging. All right, it's time for challenge question number two. Which of the following statements is not true about DSCSA requirements? A, product tracing involves providing the transaction information, transaction history, and transaction statement with each sale of product. B, verification includes quarantine and investigation of suspect product and quarantine and disposition of illegitimate product. C, when a trading partner identifies illegitimate product, it must notify FDA and other immediate trading partners within 24 hours of making the determination. D, trading partners can notify FDA of illegitimate product using the form FDA 3911 for drug notifications. E, for products under DSCSA, it is optional to encode packages with a product identifier, which is a 2D data matrix barcode that includes the NDC, serial number, lot number, and expiration date. The answer is E. This statement is not true. Manufacturers and repackagers are required to encode drugs that meet the definition of product under DSCSA with a product identifier in both human and machine readable formats. The 2D data matrix barcode that includes the NDC, serial number, lot number, and expiration date is the machine readable format. I want to mention an important compliance policy guidance that we published in October 2020 related to certain verification requirements. Requirements related to verifying the product identifier went into effect on November 27, 2020. Let's review these requirements quickly. Because manufacturers and repackagers have been encoding product identifiers on product packages since 2018, wholesale distributors and pharmacies should be buying drugs with product identifiers on them and have them on their shelves. The first requirement is related to wholesale distributors that are required to verify saleable return product down to the package level using the information in the product identifier before putting these products back into distribution. The second requirement is for pharmacies. If a pharmacy is investigating a suspect or illegitimate product, it should verify down to the package level using the information in the product identifier. Both of these requirements rely on the use of the product identifier that now contains the NDC and that new serial number. FDA recognized that some wholesale distributors and pharmacies needed additional time beyond November 27, 2020 before they can begin verifying the serial number in the product identifier of returned product prior to resale or suspect or illegitimate product, respectively. This guidance published last October describes our compliance policies regarding FDA's enforcement of these requirements for both wholesale distributors and dispensers. These policies provide three additional years to comply with these requirements. Now, FDA encourages wholesale distributors and dispensers to use this time to focus resources and efforts on the requirements for the enhanced drug distribution security system required by 2023. In addition, we remind you that these compliance policies do not affect other verification requirements for suspect and illegitimate product. You can refer to the guidance for specifics. Another guidance that I want to highlight was issued in April 2020 as the COVID-19 outbreak unfolded. This guidance explains the statutory exemption and exclusion under DSCSA for the duration of the public health emergency declared by the Secretary of Health and Human Services. 
These help to ensure adequate distribution of finished prescription drug products throughout the supply chain to combat COVID-19 infections. Covered COVID-19 products are exempted from certain product tracing and product identifier requirements and excluded from wholesale distribution requirements. These are either drug products issued an emergency use authorization to combat COVID-19, known as an EUA, or drug products approved by FDA to diagnose, cure, mitigate, treat, or prevent COVID-19. Or these involve the distribution of other products affected by the COVID-19 public health emergency, such as direct impact, like if a new temporary facility for distribution is needed, or the distribution activities are for emergency medical reasons, including to treat symptoms of COVID-19 infections. In addition, the guidance explains our compliance policy of our enforcement of the authorized trading partner requirement for certain distributions during the COVID-19 public health emergency, involving other trading partners that may not be authorized trading partners. This guidance and many other COVID-related activities demonstrate FDA's commitment to serving the public during this public health emergency. We have reviewed a lot of information and requirements for supply chain security with the goals of achieving enhanced drug distribution security by 2023. How do we achieve interoperability amongst everyone in the pharmaceutical supply chain, including FDA? What are the process or system changes needed to get to a fully electronic system? The enhanced system will need to be robust yet flexible to be able to help trading partners and FDA do several things. Identify who is a trading partner and if they are authorized. Trace products down to the package level. Verify products down to the package level. And identify suspect and illegitimate product and help to respond promptly and effectively to protect patients. What else do we need to do? Do we need to develop something new or improve something that already exists? We'll need to continue to focus on what we consider enhanced product tracing and enhanced verification. So what's next? This slide shows areas of focus for FDA for achieving enhanced drug distribution security. We intend to conduct data analyses. As we receive information like drug notifications for illegitimate product, are there trends that may signal a supply chain risk? In terms of investigations and response when suspect or illegitimate product are found, are trading partners in FDA protecting patients from illegitimate product? Future studies will include a study to assess how small dispensers can comply with these requirements and look for more guidances for industry from FDA, either new, revised, or finalizations, as we need to update information related to verification requirements, standards for data exchange, and the development of the electronic interoperable system. We will continue DSCSA implementation, including issuing regulations for the standards for licensure of wholesale distributors and 3PLs, and FDA recently completed our DSCSA pilot project program to assist the drug supply chain, stakeholders, and FDA in developing an interoperable electronic system required by 2023. The selected 20 pilot projects were led by members of the pharmaceutical distribution supply chain and examined a variety of topics, including interoperability, enhanced product tracing and verification, barcode quality, and innovative technologies. FDA will share these learnings with the public in a final program report, which will be posted on our FDA website. We hope the report will be useful for trading partners and other supply chain stakeholders. We are also aware that industry continues to conduct other pilot projects to help figure out what may work for enhanced drug distribution security, including how to achieve enhanced product tracing and verification. We hope for continued stakeholder engagement. So please be engaged and participate in our public meetings or workshops and comment on our guidances. These are our main methods to get stakeholder input. 
and we recently held a virtual public meeting in December and hope to get valuable public comments on topics related to enhanced product tracing and enhanced verification and what those functions might look like. Of course, FDA will continue its compliance and enforcement activities. There's a lot more work to do for industry and FDA, and we hope to continue to collaborate and obtain stakeholder input to implement these requirements in the most effective way. Here is the resource page that provides a link to FDA's DSCSA main webpage. You'll be able to find additional links to all the information I covered in the session, including reporting licensure, submitting 3911s for illegitimate product, future public meetings, and our DSCSA pilot project program. In addition, I provided a link to our DSCSA regulatory document webpage that includes what FDA has published thus far. It will be updated as we issue more guidances for industry and other information. So please check our website for updates. I hope you've learned why supply chain security is so important and why it is needed to protect patients from potentially harmful drugs. DSCSA provides requirements for enhanced drug distribution security. And as we continue to implement the requirements, to get to the enhanced product tracing and verification by November 2023. The tools provided by DSCSA allow us, meaning FDA and members of the supply chain, to prevent harmful drugs from entering the supply chain, to detect and identify harmful drugs as they enter the supply chain, and to respond rapidly when harmful drugs are found. Thank you so much for your attention today. And now I think there is time to take a few questions. Thank you for that great presentation, Captain John. If you haven't had a chance to enter your questions into the Q&A chat pod, please do so at this time. We have a few questions that have come in. The first question, where do 503B outsourcing facilities who repackage drug products fall with respect to DSCSA? And uh, this is Jeff. Connie, it sounds like uh, you may still be muted, perhaps on your keyboard. Um, you might want to try using the F4 keyboard to see if you can unmute in Windows. Thank you. Um, that question um, related to compounded products and 503B facilities, there's a I see a few other questions related to uh, compounded products and outsourcing facilities. So I'm going to try to give a general um, response to cover those questions. Um, based on the uh, definition of product that I reviewed earlier in the presentation, uh, lawfully compounded products are excluded from these requirements. So to the extent that um, um, you are an entity involved in, in um, in um, making compounded products, they do not fall under the DSCSA requirements. So I hope that covers a few of those questions related to those. Thank you for responding to that question. We do have another question. Are OTC drugs not covered under this these requirements? That's correct. CSCSA uh, requirements apply to prescription drugs in finished dosage form that are for human use. Uh, so OTC drugs are not, um, uh, do not fall within the scope of these requirements. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question. Where can we find the standards for wholesale and 3PLs? I've only been able to find 3PL requirements at the state level. 
Right. So currently you would find the statutory requirements uh, in the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, or FDCA, in Sections 583 and Sections 584. Now, um, FDA is required to issue regulations related to those standards, and we are actively working on those um, and hope to um, be able to publish those regulations very soon. Uh, so there will be more detailed information in those proposed regulations when we issue them. Thank you for responding to that question. Our next question, could you give some examples of certain IV products that are not covered by the supply chain law? Yes, now this is a somewhat um, uh, complex area or uh, description in, in the law, so it makes sense that some people get confused here. Um, but the law does describe um, distribution of intravenous products and, and give some, some examples, such as those that may be used to maintain equilibrium of water and minerals uh, in the body, or uh, those intended to be used for irrigation. But again, I am just giving you a few examples here. You really need to review those, uh, all of the provisions related to the intravenous products to and determine if you know, your products falls into one of those categories. Thank you for responding to that question. Our next question. Do you know when FDA will come out with licensing requirements for 3PLs as authorized trading partners under DSCSA? I'm sorry, could you repeat that uh, question for me? Do you know when the F when FDA will come <clears throat> will come out with licensing requirements for 3PLs as authorized trading partners under DSCS? Okay, um, thank you. Sorry, there's a few little layers of questions within that. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, FDA will be issuing proposed regulations for the standards for licensure for both wholesale distributors and third-party logistics providers, or 3PLs. Um, and while I cannot give you an exact timing on that, uh, like I said, we have really been trying to um, get those regulations out because we know how important they are for not just the uh, trading partners themselves, but also for the, uh, the state regulators as well. So. Um, Please keep looking for updates on that. We are trying to get those regulations out as soon as possible um, to, for both those entities, wholesale distributors and third-party logistics providers. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question we have, will blockchain be a next step in the evolution of DSCSA and our discussion started on such of an evolution of this? So, uh, you know, blockchain is something that um, we are very aware that industry is looking into as a, you know, potential technologies. And, and, and there are other technologies that also have uh, potential in this space. And so, um, uh, actually, our pilot project program had several projects that looked into the use of blockchain as a technology to help with uh, traceability and packaging the um, transactional information related to the DSCC requirements. So um, while I can't say that it, it's, it's um, uh, that we've chosen or endorsed or approved a specific technology, uh, we are aware that blockchain is you know, has some utility and traction in terms of um, drug traceability and other and traceability for other products. 
So um, I think, you know, for the um, industry and also other stakeholders is to keep an eye on uh, different advancements in technology in this space, whether it's blockchain or other technologies. Thank you for responding to that question. Will tracing requirements be applicable in the future for cell and gene therapy products? So um, unless the uh, products are explicitly exempted in the statutory language, which I summarized in the, uh, the slides for product and transaction, um, the DSCC requirements may apply. So um, I do admit that I am not uh, a subject matter expert on cell and gene therapeutics. So um, you may need to submit a specific question to our Center for Biologics and Evaluation uh, Research, depending on where your products lie in terms of um, the regulatory classification. Um, so I can't answer your question directly, depending on whether the products would fall under any of the exclusions that are already mentioned in the statute. Thank you for responding to that question. Our next question. Imaging drugs appear to be excluded. How can we be sure our imaging drug is excluded? Uh, yes, the uh, the same uh, definition that I referred to earlier in terms of product does uh, exclude radioactive drugs and biologics in addition to imaging drugs. Uh, so those products are excluded from these requirements. Um, and if you're not sure, you can always submit a question uh, to the agency to confirm your your assessment of your product. Thank you for responding to that question. And this one's a long one, so here's our next question. There's industry discussion that the 2023 will sunset the transaction history requirement, that the post-2023 interoperable environment will not provide the transaction history data, and that wholesale distributors are legally prohibited from sharing this history with upstream authorized manufacturers. Is this an accurate narrative? And assuming that the narrative is accurate, what public health policy goal is behind prohibiting wholesale distributors from collaborating for compliance purposes with authorized manufacturers? OK, this is a very. Um Good question, and I think I just need to clarify a few things. So in my uh, presentation, I talked about product tracing information that included the transaction history, transaction, I'm sorry, let's start with transaction information, then the transaction history and transaction statement. And this question is referring to the transaction history requirement that in November 2023, the requirement to provide the transaction history does um, sunset or go away in terms of that requirement and that provision. Um, however, the question which um, speaks about uh, whether a wholesale distributor is legally pre prohibited from providing the transaction history information after that time, um, is I don't know that that's uh, um, uh, an accurate statement or narrative because there is no uh, prohibited act stating that you um, or a wholesale distributor is prohibited from providing that information. In other words, there are many things that trading partners um, can do on a voluntary basis. So there's not a penalty necessarily outlined in the statute if you continue to provide this information. Now, again, I will reiterate that, yes, it is accurate to say that the transaction history requirement does sunset in November 2023. That is accurate. 
Uh, now, there are additional requirements that go into effect in 2023 related to product tracing that fall under the enhanced product tracing requirements such that the information, uh, transaction information and transaction statement are still being provided required to be provided with each sale of uh, product under DSCSA. Uh, and there are some other provisions related to uh, gathering the information related to each transaction information all the way back to the manufacturer. And so uh, there may be some room for interpretation of some of these provisions, but if we think about uh, the enhanced system in 2023, now that it, we would be in a fully electronic world, you know, how would this, these functions be done, you know, in that electronic world and where we'll have some efficiencies and, and automation occurring with the product identifier. So it's a little bit complicated, um, but I just wanted to be clear on some of those components related to uh, transaction history and what changes in 2023. Thank you for responding to that question. Our next question, is radio frequency identification, also known as RFID, allowed for serialization process? Well, that's a good question. Um, RFID has been around as a potential data carrier technology for a while. However, currently the statute uh, indicates that the current product identifier machine readable format is the 2D data matrix barcode for packages. Now, uh, similar to my previous response, um, if a, a, a trading partner would like to use a different technology for a data carrier such as RFID, they can always uh, submit a question to the agency um, for another method um, of meeting certain requirements. So again, it's not, not necessarily prohibited, right, to try a different technology, but there may be, uh, for in this case, because the statute um, does indicate that the current machine-readable data carrier is a 2D data matrix barcode, um, to not have the 2D data matrix barcode would be, you know, not following the requirements. So uh, in most cases, you may be able to do additional things, um, you know, but of course, if it is outlined either in statute or regulation, you, you need to follow those requirements unless you're given special um, approval by the agency to do something different. Thank you for responding to that question. Our next question, are there any timelines to file closure of Form 3911, say for example, in case of stolen drug product, if the investigation did not reveal any evidence as this could take a long time? This is a good question and I'll just make sure it's clear. I believe it's related to the FDA Form 3911s, which are used to submit drug notifications to FDA for illegitimate product. So in addition, this form is used to submit terminations of drug notifications of illegitimate product, which I believe the question is referring to when they're talking about filing a closure of the Form 3911. So realize that when you do submit uh, a, a drug notification uh, or 3911 form um, of an illegitimate product, you're basically making us aware that there, that you um, have an incident of illegitimate product and that you are either, you know, currently investigating, gathering information, or if you have done what you can do related to that um, uh, incident, you would also be using that mechanism to inform us. So there are not specific timelines. As we know, investigations can take, um, you know, some time. Uh, but in the event that you do feel that 
um, the incident is resolved. For example, let's say it was a stolen product, and then uh, three months later, after various investigations, you were able to place the product and find it, um, and then uh, disposition it or dispose of it properly. Then that if you um, are comfortable with that resolution, you would submit your um, termination request of your 3911, and it would get reviewed by the agency, and we would um, let you know that we concur with what you know your resolution. So again, no specific timelines. Obviously, um, you know it, as soon as you determine um, that it's it's resolved, um, it, to let us know as well. But uh, we recognize that investigations can take um, a certain amount of time. Thank you for responding to that question. Where can a list of authorized trading partners be obtained? So I know I reviewed these requirements earlier in the presentation. Unfortunately, as, at this time, I am not aware that there is a single source for this information. So recognizing that DSCC requirements apply to many, many stakeholders across the entire pharmaceutical supply chain. And as you saw on my slide, there are different components that have been, um, uh, the oversight is by different entities. So whether it's something that FDA takes care of or perhaps the state uh, or other, um, that's why I listed those different resources that are available to you for the different trading partners. So at this time, there isn't a one-stop uh, one shop for a list of authorized trading partners. Um, there are different ways that you can get this, either your own due diligence by um, looking up the entities yourself or contacting the entities yourself, or maybe you have a, a business practice where you get that information when you become a business partner. Um, there may be other ways that you can um, obtain the information, um, like you know, dealing with your your um, your trading partner. So um, that's the best advice that we can give at this time. You know, if that changes, obviously you will there will be something issued um, either you know by FDA if uh, or or perhaps um, industry or uh, a third party could come up with a mechanism for trying to compile all of the information in one place. But um, it, it is pretty fairly um, complex just because, like I said, uh, m much of the, the information, the licensing, um, or the registration are right now done by different entities at the federal or the state level. So um, that's the best that advice that I can provide at this time. Thank you for responding to that question. Our next question. You mentioned the counterfeit HIV drugs in TUSA. How serious is this counterfeit, and has anyone been harmed? So thank you for that question. Um, you know, the U.S. drug supply chain is one of the safest in the world. You've heard me and uh, my colleagues repeat that over and over. We are fortunate not to see as many counterfeit incidences in the U.S. as other countries. However, one counterfeit is too many, and each counterfeit incident is a serious issue for FDA. And members of the supply chain should feel the same way. Now, in the case of this counterfeit Sintuza, because it's an ongoing investigation, I can't, uh, I don't have more information that I've already shared, but as of today, we have not seen any adverse events from this particular counterfeit, but as we get more information with our investigation, we will share important updates to protect public health from any illegitimate product like this. Thank you for responding to that question. Our next question. There are a lot of DSCSA requirements. What should our company be focusing on, and we're a drug manufacturer? Uh, 
Okay, that's a good question. I uh, There are a lot of requirements that I went over, but I'm just going to review a few of them for all the trading partners very quickly. Um, manufacturers and repackagers should be serializing their product with the product identifier since 2018. In addition, manufacturers and repackagers should also uh, be verifying the product down to the package level, meaning using the product identifier information if they receive a verification request from another trading partner. Now, wholesale distributors and dispensers or pharmacies, they should be buying um, products that are serialized, that are covered under this law. And, um, and, and hopefully that is uh, what they're seeing on their shelves at this point. Uh, and, and now while I just reviewed um, requirements that are focusing on serialized product with the product identifier, I just want to remind folks that there are other, you know, other requirements specifically related to verification that went into effect and have been in effect since 2015. So generally speaking, if you get a request to uh, verify product, you should be able to verify the product and have systems in place to be able to do so based on the information that you do have, meaning at the lot level at this point. So um, really recommend reviewing our three guidances related to verification requirements. Um, and we will uh, be updating and revising some of those guidances in the very near future. So you will need to check for updates um, as well on those guidances. Thank you for responding to that question. Well, that's all the time we have for questions during this session. A huge thank you to Captain Jung for a great presentation and answering all the questions that came in.